and uh, you know, I'm just so thankful for that illustration that illustrates so greatly, great the, the purpose of Jesus, that sin had so permeated the world, but God sent his son into the world, not to condemn us, but to save us. And that picture of his, the cross of Jesus coming right in and cleaning us, purifying us from all sin. I love the verse in Psalm 103 that says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. That's what Jesus did for us. Isaiah says, though your sins are like scarlet, though they are red like crimson, I will make them white as snow. And that's what Jesus can do in each and every one of our lives today. This morning, I, I'm so glad that you're here. My name's Jeff, I'm one of the pastors. Actually, my title is senior pastor. I've been here a long time and they didn't know what to do with me, so they just made me the senior pastor. Those of you that, <laughs> Cleo, don't shake your head yes. <laughs> Well, we are so glad that you're here. If you're a guest today, we are truly honored that you are here to worship with us on this very special day. And uh, we hope that you feel right at home. It's Easter, Easter Sunday, the most important day of the year for Christians. Today, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. We celebrate because he overcame and defeated death, hell, and the grave, and he lives. Jesus said in, in Revelation chapter one, he said, I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. He overcame. And it's the most important difference between Christianity and all other religions. No other religious leader ever claimed that he would, uh, predicted his own death and his own resurrection and then actually follow through on that promise. But that's what Jesus did. On that Sunday after Jesus was, was crucified and, and buried in the, in, the, in, the, in the grave, on the Sunday after there was some women that went to the tomb to, with some spices to prepare his body. And as they got to the tomb, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And as they went into the tomb, his body was missing. Something was up. They were perplexed. And then the scripture says that uh, two men in, in shining garments were standing there. And this is what they said. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. And then they remembered that he had said this. They just didn't understand who has taken the body of Jesus. But he had predicted that that's what he was gonna do and he made good on the promise. I love this book, the Bible. This is life, this is, this is a story of love. And I love the simplicity of the scriptures. That although some, of, some people are intimidated by the book, listen, it is so simple in its, in its entirety. There is, there is one villain in this book, who is he? Satan. There is one hero, what is his name? Jesus. And he had one mission and that was to rescue. And that's what he did. Jesus came to rescue us. He is our hero who came to rescue us, to save us, to help us, and to heal us. And that's who we gather together today to worship and celebrate. We're in a series in the book of Genesis, and we come to an incredible story in chapter 22. It's a story of a father and a son, Abraham and his son Isaac. And this story amazingly parallels the story of Jesus. You'll notice that the similarities between Isaac and Jesus are incredible. When we're first introduced to Abraham and Sarah, back in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham was 75 years old, Sarah was 65 years old, and they received a promise from God that Abraham would be the father of many nations, which is an incredible promise. The only problem was they had no children. And at 65 and 75, that's not the time when you uh, think I'm getting ready to start a family, but that's the promise that God gave them. And it wasn't until he was 100, Abraham, and Sarah 90, that they actually were pregnant and she gave birth at age 90. It's a miraculous thing. At, at the time they received the promise, she was already well past childbearing years. But here they have a son, this promised child whom they named Isaac. And what we've learned in this series in Genesis is that God keeps his promises. And the message that I wanna share with you this morning, I've entitled, The Lord Will Provide. 
And I want to just encourage you this morning, if you have a need in your life, whether it's a physical healing or a restoration of a relationship or there's just circumstances in your life that feel overwhelming, that seem beyond your control. Maybe you just need forgiveness today and a fresh start with God. Here's what I want to tell you. God is a promise keeper. He keeps his promises. He makes a way where things seem to be impossible. He performs miracles. He's, he's doing miracles right here in our church. I'd love to share with you some stories we've shared in the past few weeks, and I might be able to share one with you this morning. But that's what he does. He provides everything that you need. The Lord will provide if you trust him. So we're gonna pray at the end of the message, and I wanna pray for you. Pray that God would meet those needs, that he would provide for you whatever it is that you have need of. So Genesis chapter 22, if you have your Bibles, you're turning there. Genesis 22 verse one begins by saying sometime later. Sometime later, after Isaac was born just in the previous chapter, God tested Abraham's faith. He said, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. At this point, Isaac is a young man. We're not sure of his age, but he is, a, he is a, a young man, probably in his late teens, early 20s. And we're gonna see that God is gonna test Abraham's faith again. He's already been through a series of tests. I wanna ask you a question this morning. How many of you like tests? How many of you remember a time in your life when you were a child and you remember your teacher saying, all right, take out a clean sheet of paper and a pencil? Not a great memory. What do we, what do we call that time? What, what is that called? A pop quiz. Whether it's a test, a quiz, a midterm, or a final, here's the thing. Tests happen in life. Tests are there to see what you know, what you've learned, maybe what you haven't learned, what you've missed. There are tests that happen uh, to determine the strength or the endurance of something. Tests are just part of life. And here's what I wanna tell you this morning. God tests us to make us strong. God tests us to make us strong. It's what James says, consider it pure joy when you, when you face troubles or trials or tests of various kinds because the testing of your faith produces perseverance so that you can be complete and mature, lacking nothing. So God tests us to make us strong. Satan tempts us. Listen, God doesn't tempt us. He tests us to make us strong. Satan tempts us to make us do wrong. Does that make sense? So here's Abraham's test, verse two. God says, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Remember that name, Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. Here's the deal. Abraham and Sarah had waited 25 years from the time they first received this promise until Isaac was born. So what is going on here with God's request, God's command to Abraham? He's commanding him. He's asking, he's telling him, take the life of your son, the promised one. This doesn't make any sense. We have children in the room with us today, and it's so good to have our kids with us. I want to ask if you are a, uh, one, of our, one of our kids in Kids Church K through 5, if you would just stand where you are right t t this morning. I know there's a few of you that I greeted when you came in. Look at this. Look across the room. We've got a few. Early morning. I'm proud of these families getting up and getting everybody dressed um, on, on Easter Sunday. Kids, this is, this is what I want to tell you this morning. We're honored that you are here with us today. And we love you. Here's what I can tell you. God loves you so much. God has a plan for your lives. And I can tell you that your parents love you so much as well. And, and I would say this, that none of us as parents are perfect. But I can tell you that as parents, if we receive the message like Abraham received for Isaac, I don't know that we would be so faithful and so committed with what he's telling us, it would be hard for us to imagine obeying God to that extent. That would be tough. But I want you to know that this story today is not about someone dying. This story is about God's great love for us. This story is pointing us to something in the future. 
We see that Abraham had great faith. He had trust in God. Look at his response. Verse three says, early the next morning, Abraham got up. Abraham got up early the next morning. He knew that God was gonna take care of things. Very early the next morning, he got up. This is what I can tell you. Most of us in the room wouldn't have got up early. If you had a message from the Lord that this is what you were to do, this would be my natural response. I'm not getting out of bed today. Pulling the covers over my head. God, and maybe you've been in one of those days before where you say, I hope this day just never comes. But this is what he's facing and he gets up early the next morning. I think he got up early for several reasons. One, I think he, maybe he was just a, an early morning person. How many early morning people are, are here? Well, you're, you're here in the early service. Of course you are. Get up early. You know, because you can spend quiet time with God. Maybe that's what Abraham had going on. He get, you know, spend time with God, drink some coffee, just a great time of the day. But here's what I think really was the reason why he got up early the next morning. So he didn't have to talk to Sarah. <laughs> can you imagine the conversation? It doesn't say anything in the scripture that Sarah even knew about this. So I'm assuming she, she probably didn't know, and he got up early that morning because he didn't want to have the conversation. Because if he said, this is what God asked me to do, or told me to do, she said, you, 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 you do what? Not with my child, you're not. This is, the, this is the promised child. You can't even think about it. I mean, I'm sure Abraham was looking for someone to, someone to talk to, but who would understand? This doesn't make sense. This is crazy. Abraham didn't understand, yet the Bible says that he trusted God. He knew that he had to be obedient to God. So early the next morning, with his heart being torn apart inside, he makes things ready for this journey to sacrifice. Verse 3, the next morning Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey, took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac, and then he chopped the wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place that God had told him about. He set off for where? Moriah, I told you to remember that, Moriah, keep that in mind. A three-day journey from where they were, about 50 miles. I can't imagine traveling for three days like that, but three days with all of this on your heart and mind, knowing what you're going there to do, this internal struggle must have been unbearable. But verse four says, on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there and we will come right back. Here we see the faith of Abraham. The boy and I, we're gonna go up to the mountain. We're gonna worship there and we will come right back. What did God told him to do? Sacrifice his son, his own only son Isaac, the one whom he loved, sacrificed him as a burnt offering to the Lord. And he said, listen, we're going to come back. We will come back right away. He had faith that while things looked bleak, that God would work it out. In Hebrews chapter 11, it speaks of Abraham uh, in verse 19. It says, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. So if God's asking me to do this, I know that he can resurrect him from the dead. Verse six, so Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? Abraham's response is, God will provide. God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And they both walked on together. God will provide. Can you say that with me? God will provide. Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, God will provide. How many of you believe this morning that whatever your need is in your life, that God can and will provide it? This is a step of faith. If you don't have the kind of trust that God's gonna provide whatever you have need of, not just the little things, not just the easy things, but the big things, the difficult things, the things that don't make sense, the things that you go, how in the world could this ever work out? 
But I'm guessing that there are plenty of us in the room today who have been in those situations and we see that God has worked things out even better than we imagined it could have been. Some things just seem so hard to believe, so hard to expect. But whatever it is that you're needing in your life today, I want to remind you that God will provide. This morning, if you are in a desperate place in a relationship with your, with your spouse, your marriage is just hanging on by a thread, here's what I can tell you. God will provide. God will provide. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction. Maybe someone in your family struggling with addiction, whether it's drugs or alcohol or pornography, whatever it might be, asking, what am I going to do? Where do I go? Listen, God will provide. You're dealing with the death of a loved one or maybe a relationship that's been torn apart, a divorce, or you just have a broken heart and you're asking yourself, how am I going to make it? How do I move on from here? Will my heart ever heal? This is the answer. God will provide. You're in the middle of a financial struggle. God will provide whatever it is that you have need of. Maybe you're just asking a question, why am I here? Is my life really making a difference? God will provide. It's not blind faith that's driving Abraham. Through the course of his life, he has become convinced that God has a plan. He has seen over and over, God, you have a plan. And you're going to notice in this story that Abraham doesn't even seem to flinch at what he's asked to do moving forward with God's command. By his actions, we see that Abraham had complete faith and trust in God's goodness, in his character, in his power, and in his plan. Verse 9, when they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar, and he arranged the wood on it. And then he tied his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. I am struck in awe, not by, even just by Abraham's actions of following through with this, without seeming to flinch, but Isaac's response. This is a young man. A big enough man to carry the wood for this sacrifice. I don't know if any of you have carried wood before. Wood is not light. And he's carrying enough wood for a burnt offering. It's going to burn for a while. Here's a young man. His dad's tying his hands and saying, Isaac, I'm putting you on the altar. And there's no, there's no um, verbiage here at all that says that he even struggled. He trusted his dad. His dad had faith and he was compliant. He, there was a complete trust and a willing obedience to his father. I want to finish reading this story from the Jesus Storybook Bible, partly for the benefit of our kids, but I think you will benefit from this as well. The Jesus Storybook Bible says it like this. And so he trusted him. This is Isaac. He climbed up on the altar and Abraham tied his boy to the wood. Isaac didn't struggle or try to run away. He just lay there quietly and didn't make a sound. Everything was ready. Abraham took the knife. Tears were filling up in his eyes. Pain was filling up his heart. His hand was shaking. He lifted the knife high into the air. Stop, God said. Don't hurt the boy. I want him to live, not to die. I know that you love me because you would have given me your only son. And Abraham felt his heart leap with joy. He unbound Isaac and folded him in his arms. Great sobs shook the old man's whole body. Scalding tears filled his eyes. And for a long time, they stayed there like that in each other's arms, the boy and his dad. Suddenly, Abraham saw a ram caught in some brambles, the sacrifice God had given them what they needed just in time. The ram would die so that Isaac didn't have to. And so Abraham sacrificed the ram instead of his son. God will provide. God provided for Abraham that day. An incredible story of God's provision. Jehovah Jireh. This is verse 14. Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Jireh. The Lord will provide. 
And it says that to this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Jehovah Jireh. This is where God first reveals his name as the provider, Jireh. And we'll see throughout scripture, God providing for his people. Philippians 4.19, Paul says this, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. The Lord will provide. In Matthew chapter six, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, don't worry about your everyday life, about food or drink or clothing. And he uses a couple of examples. He says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Look at the lilies of the field. They don't work, they don't make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Jesus goes on to say, don't worry about these things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Listen, God knows what you need even before you ask. And if he is Jireh, the provider, then you know that he has it all right available just for the asking. God, provide my needs. I trust you to provide my needs. He goes on to say, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. My God will supply all my needs. The Lord will provide. I mentioned earlier that this story of Abraham and Isaac is pointing to something in the future and what it points us to is Jesus. Isaac is an incredible example, a picture of who Jesus would be. It's tax season. Sorry to change the mood on you. (laughs) But many of you know when you go to sign your taxes or you go to get a loan from the bank or you're signing a loan for a mortgage, you've got a stack of papers and you've got these little stickers with an arrow pointing to where you are to sign. How many know what that experience is like? Okay, Isaac is like that sticker pointing to Jesus. I want you to see the similarities, the parallels of the story of Isaac to Jesus. Just in what we've read so far and what we've seen, listen, Isaac and Jesus are both the fulfillment of promises. They're the fulfillment of promises. Isaac, the long promised son to Abraham and Sarah. This this promise was so unbelievable. I mean, at the age that Abraham and Sarah were, and they didn't, like by the time they got to 190, they still didn't have a child. Both Abraham and Sarah couldn't believe this. The scriptures say that they both laughed, like how could this be? It sounded so ridiculous. Jesus was the long-promised, long-awaited Messiah. The religious leaders of the day, they knew the scriptures. They knew the prophecies all throughout the the Old Testament are prophecies about the Messiah that was to come. They should have known. They did know these scriptures, but they didn't connect. They were so blind that they didn't connect the prophecies, even though he was right in front of them, but they're both the fulfillment of prophecies. Both Jesus and Isaac, their birth was pre-announced. There was an angel that told them, you are going to have a child. Both Isaac and Jesus were named before they were ever born. You will give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You will call his name Isaac. Both had a miraculous birth. Isaac being born to parents who were well beyond childbearing years. Jesus born to a virgin. Listen, both of them, Jesus and Isaac, carried wood. Isaac carried the wood up the mountain to Mount Moriah for the sacrifice, which was to be him. Jesus, the Bible tells us, carried his cross all the way to Calvary. They both submitted to their father. Isaac willingly allowed Abraham to put him on the altar. Jesus in the garden said, Lord, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And both of them were sacrificed in or near the same place. 
Did you know that Moriah, where God had instructed Abraham to go to sacrifice Isaac, is the same place of Mount Calvary. You can go to Chronicles and you see that Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. It all happened in the same place. This was a foreshadowing, a picture of what was to come. Jehovah Jireh provided a sacrifice. Abraham's statement in Genesis 22, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided, refers more than, than just to Isaac and Mount Moriah. It referred to Jesus and Mount Calvary that was to come. His statement to Isaac that God would provide a lamb sounds so much familiar and is a parallel statement to John the Baptist's statement preceding Jesus where he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Incredible, the parallels, the foreshadowing of God providing his son, Jesus, as a sacrifice to save the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish, but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Romans 5, 8 tells us that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 8, 32 says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things, reminds us that God is a provider. God is a provider of our salvation. Through his son, Jesus, Jesus willingly went to the cross. He was crucified. He was buried, but he rose again, overcoming death, hell, and the grave to bring salvation to you. His blood was shed so that you could be forgiven and set free. Just like the picture of the illustration that Pastor Courtney shared on the video. He can take your sins, though they be scarlet, and make them clear as snow, white as snow. Are you thankful for that today? That you before him, you, you, look, you look perfect. Through the blood of Jesus, we're justified, meaning we're just as if we've never sinned. That's how he sees us, through the blood of Jesus. It's a matter of trusting him. Faith in the one who can provide everything that you have need of. This is where the parallel ends. God spared Isaac and provided a, a, another sacrifice, but he didn't spare his own son. He gave his son up for all of us. And if he's willing to do that to save you, do you think that he's willing to provide everything else that you have need of too? I wanna to ask for you to bow your heads, close your eyes with me in the room. And I just wanna ask this question today, maybe, maybe today you don't know a relationship with Jesus. You've not experienced being forgiven of your sins. Or today maybe you, you have known Jesus, but today you're saying, I need a fresh start with God. I need forgiveness for my sin. If that's you in the room and today you would receive eternal life, you would receive salvation as a free gift so that you could be forgiven and set free so that your life could be filled with hope and purpose and meaning and truth. And that's you today. Would you just raise your hand? This is a free gift that God gives you. Anyone in the room today say, I want that gift. I need to be forgiven. I need a fresh start with Jesus. Thank you. Anyone else? Today, maybe you have a need in your life. Listen, what I can tell you is that he is Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Today, if you have some need in your life, I mentioned several earlier, maybe it's your marriage, you're struggling in your marriage, it feels like it's hanging on by a thread. Maybe you struggle with addiction or there's somebody in your family that's struggling with addiction, a loved one, you know that that affects all of you in your family. And today, if you have that need, I would say you could stand in for them and pray for them and, and ask that God would meet that need as crazy as it seems, how impossible it might seem, he can do that. Maybe you have a broken heart for whatever reason is struggling after the loss of a loved one or a relationship that's been torn apart. Maybe you've got a, a, a family member who is away from, away from Jesus. Whatever your need is today, if you have a need, I wanna just ask that you would stand right where you are. 
And I'm going to pray. We're going to pray together as a church, and we're going to ask God to meet those needs. Whatever the need is today, you need Jehovah Jireh to provide for you. Don't miss the opportunity. Don't miss the situation. Can I tell you, there is a young lady in the room today, Stella Clark, had this experience on Friday. Years ago when she was a child, she, she hurt her tooth, and they thought her tooth would, would die and never, never come back to life again. Here she is, a 20-year-old young woman, on Friday, went to the, uh, the oral surgeon, the endodontist, and uh, this tooth started having some issues a few weeks ago. And she, she, uh, an abscess started on her gums. They sent the x-rays to the doctor and the doctor said, we're gonna have to pull this tooth. It's her very front tooth. She has an incredibly beautiful smile. And she reached out to us and said, pray. I would love to save my tooth, but more than that, I would love for this to be a witness and a testimony to my doctor. And so we prayed. This is the message that came back. The doctor said, she said he was scratching his head saying, is this the same tooth we were looking at? Because there is nothing wrong with this tooth. This tooth is just fine and it'll be okay. Praise the Lord. We have miracle stories of people being healed of MS, PNKD, of diabetes. I don't know what you have need of today, but if you have a need of anything, would you just stand in the place? I believe that God, our provider, wants to meet us right where we are today. By faith, we trust him. It's not in our ability, it's totally him. He is the provider. We just have to be obedient to follow after, to trust and bring our needs to him and say, God, here I am. Father, in this room today, there are many who are standing. Lord, I am believing, God, that you're going to restore relationships, that you're going to heal marriages, that you're going to save our, our, our children who are wayward. Lord, that you are going to restore families. God, that you are going to heal addictions, that you're going to break the bondage of, of addiction in people's lives, that you're going to heal depression. God, that you're going to bring physical healing, that you're going to work miracles of all kinds, because that's who you are. You are Jehovah Jireh our provider. Jesus, you paid the price on the cross, not only for our sin, and there are people in the room who are coming back to you. Jesus, would you meet our needs? We thank you that you're a good God who does good things. We trust you. We believe you. We're asking and expecting God for you to answer our prayers this morning because of who you are. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Would you stand this morning? Let's thank God. He's a good God who does good things. Let's lift our voices to him.